hey there, cats and kittens. I think we'll get started. So uh, if you give me a moment, I'll do the thing. Uh, my name is Aji. I use they, them pronouns. And I work at ThoughtPot. I also don't know what else to say for these things. So um, the highways where I grew up had pedestrian walkways over the top of them. And so once as a young child, I asked, what is a pedestrian? To which my father replied, it's someone who chooses to walk rather than drive a car. So for years I thought capital P pedestrians were a religious group identifiable by their beliefs that forbade them the use of the automobile. <laughs> But you're here to think about process, about automation, the promise of the computer age, thinking machines that relieve us of the burden of manual work. Steve Jobs spoke of a bicycle of the mind, computers working in tandem with their operators to close the gap between thought and action. So why in this auspicious time where Ruby, the most dynamic of languages, has static typing, is there still so much manual toil? We're supposed to be making progress on delivering value to our users, our businesses, our clients, while the tool chain keeps getting longer, the tech stacks keep getting taller, and deadlines only get closer. We have to keep so much in our heads, juggle at least three project management apps, and Brittany and Julie say I'm supposed to start a podcast now, I guess. <laughs> I don't have time to walk my dogs in the morning without listening to a tech podcast for fear that I might fall behind. Forget one hill, there are a thousand hills and Gemma can't hold my hand up all of them. To make any progress at all, we'd have to press pause on feature work and go off into some magical land without meetings, without JIRA, without Slack or hybrid offices, base camp code review, documentation, TPS reports, direct reports, import maps, webpacker, yak shaving, dog fooding, the bike shed and bike shedding, Terraform, Mastodon, Elon Musk, the metaverse, pattern matching, sorbet, gem install, Rails new, hotwire, stimulus, strata, still coming soon, OAuth, 2FA, MFA, TCP, IP, UDP, FTP, SMTP, S3, PHP, NLP, SQL, DHL, DHH, DNS, DND, CSS, AWS, ASDF, APFS, AI, API, MRI, GUI, FYI, ROI, and RVM, RBENV, make, reek, make, rake, reek, tweets, toots, blogs, flog, reflog, and now, now there is a Rails Foundation, and I don't even know what that means. <laughs> When am I supposed to automate? I still haven't set the clock on my microwave back an hour. <laughs> we need a moment of zen. Be with me. So let us consider this popular quote from the Taoist thinker Lao Tzu. Lao Tzu wouldn't have known the term Zen Buddhism he, or they, because we don't actually know if it was just one person, was a Chinese philosopher influenced by and building on Central Asian and Indian traditions and mythology. Zen is a school of thought born in the Tang Dynasty of China that came into its own in Japan, was influenced by Lao Tzu, and stood on the shoulders of hundreds of years of dedicated practitioners and scholars. All that is to say, what I'm about to do is a hand-wavy and reductive device in the service of a pithy phrase for a conference talk. But the best way to describe what needs to be taken in order to achieve progress in our goal of harnessing automation in the service of developer happiness is a mindset, a practice, and a relationship to our work. We're going to explore several principles of this mindset that in shorthand we'll refer to as Zen automation. Because like Zen or even test-driven development, this is a practice rather than a gem to install. So let's reflect on Lao Tzu's poetry and reframe our conception of automation as an all or nothing prospect. You wouldn't set out to write a JIRA card that says implement tests for order serialization. The tests are part of the work. They're not a separate deliverable. And we'll find that 
So too is it often incongruous to write a ticket to automate new employee account creation, as our change in mindset will carry practitioners of Zen automation towards that goal a single step at the time. I promise I do love my tech podcast and my dogs do too. <laughs> and yes, Andy, even those where three white guys talk about Apple products. <laughs> I wanna share a practical example of the practice of Zen automation through a task that I encountered some years ago and show how these principles guided my approach. Chapter one. <laughs> no. <laughs> I was working on a product that had a concept of locations. Users would schedule their clients to go to a specific location for different activities. There were hundreds, if not thousands, of these locations across the country. As launch day grew closer, that partial list of locations hadn't changed since seed data from day one. There wasn't any tooling in place and no UI existed for new or updating of locations. As anticipated, I was given a list of a few dozen locations that needed to be added to the system, a straightforward enough task. Parse and massage the list to the shape of our data, populate it into the database, no business logic, no UI changes. So I opened my text editor to a fresh new markdown file and began with the first principle of Zen automation. Always be capturing. The importance of this step cannot be over-exaggerated. None of the rest of this works unless you start by writing it down and write everything down. I had only a single list of new locations to add and yet I started with a markdown file to capture documentation. That file was going to be my scratch pad, the edge cases I considered, links, thoughts, learnings, and of course, the steps I took to complete the work. I had this one-off task, taking a list, dropping a bunch of extraneous data, passing that file to some servers, making new records. I could have thought, well, I'll never have to do this again. It's so quick, why bother with the notes? But the key to this becoming a habit, embodying our mindset of Zen automation, is lowering the activation energy to creating and maintaining documentation. Activation energy is a minimum threshold of energy that has to exist in a system before a reaction will take place. It's that motivation you need to build up to finally go clean the leaves out of the gutters. It's that second cup of coffee high that you need to hit before you can make it through the weekly planning meeting. It means making choices and using the tools at our disposal to reduce the friction that stands between us and the goal. As we reduce the friction, the energy required to reach our goals is less. And what is that goal again? Hey. Remove the mental cost of considering the question, is this worth documenting by documenting everything by default? A practitioner of Zen automation has favorite ways to quick start a new doc file and does it all the time. We'll remove the friction of deciding what folder to put something in with an inbox, a pig pen, a catch-all folder to be sorted later when its place becomes obvious. Or my favorite, you lean on search and you never have to worry about arbitrary organization ever again. Let's live in edit mode. There isn't a cost associated with switching between the document viewer and the document editor because we never left the editor in the first place. If the wiki is in something like Confluence, we leave that tab open in edit mode instead of view. We'll prefer raw markdown in VS Code over a separate app. Small choices that alone don't cost anything and relieve minor friction, but in aggregate support a shift in mindset about how we complete a task and a rebalancing of what we value as part of our work. And not to get recursive on you, but those workflows can be further smoothed over by personal automation, orchestration of your local machine that bends it to your will. Maybe an Alfred workflow to open a specific tab of the browser for the document that you're working on. A fuzzy file search so your notes are always right nearby. Not everything has to be a formal document for the historical record. Maybe it starts as a three-line file on the desktop. Uh, we'll shorten the round trip from thought to action by paying attention to our workflows, capturing them into a text file and turning the inner eye of Zen automation on ourselves. How again? I looked over the file the client had sent over. A lot of extra data that we didn't need. I wanted name, address. So I used a Vim macro to chop out the cruft, and since recorded Vim commands are just text, I copy-pasted them into my notes. 
Could have just as easily used Excel, Google Sheets, do the same work and written out the steps. I suppose you could do it with awk if that's your jam. Getting it from a tidy list to the servers it needed to live on was non-trivial, and I'll spare you the specifics, but needless to say, my markdown file filled with commands and AWS GovCloud hoops to jump through. Predictively, the one-off task that I would never have to do again came back the next morning. The client found a few more locations that needed to get thrown in, and could I do it again? It was less than 24 hours since I had last added locations to the app, but instead of charging ahead with my memory of the steps I took, I opened the document from the day before and followed along with myself of yesterday as I went. Here's where we encounter the second principle of Zen automation in which we will refine to be fine. Because we've written it down, we can iterate on it. If you don't write it down, you're iterating on your memory of it. And Sandy Metz said that you should depend on things that change less often than you do. That was in the context of code dependencies, but it's good advice. You should rely on stability and build on solid foundations. So stay away from human memory. It is buggy AF. The situation was essentially the same as the day before, but instead of rediscovering the process, I copy-pasted over the macro to reformat the text. I had been a diligent practitioner of Zen automation. Each command was in my document, copy-pasted a line at a time into my terminal. Not having to spend gray matter compute cycles remembering what had been effective yesterday because I still had it. The documentation was essentially code, a checklist akin to pseudocode automation to be executed by the homo sapiens runtime. Guided by the first and second principles, we are already reaping the rewards only the second time through. Time spent looking up how to use said for the thousandth time can instead cut straight to the chase with a fraction of the time, effort, and toil. And what was the cost? Typing into a document? We're professional typers. Already, it's feeling like automation, just following instructions, expending a sliver of the thought and energy. The first time, we're assembling the path clearing the way along an uncharted route. In further iterations, we have the capacity to notice ways to enhance the steps because we're not hacking through the unknown. We've freed up mental bandwidth and given ourselves a chance to make things clearer, faster, more robust. The mentality of working in edit mode comes in handy again. This time, we're not lowering the activation energy to create the thing in the first place, but the activation energy required for improvements. Because our tooling is ready to modify and update and our mindset is there to match, small changes that make the script better jump off the screen. We construct a positive feedback loop that reduces slog and cognitive load one manual iteration at a time, which frees up more opportunity for improvement, which in turn frees up more opportunity for improvement. And what can improvement even look like at this step? Descriptions of actions can be converted to command line snippets. Actions that used to take mouse click could get converted to a command. Something once done through a GUI can turn into an API call. Combine two steps into one with a pipe and exargs. Parameterize steps for reuse, anticipating a quicker on-ramp to eventual programmatic control. Unblur steps, things like make sure it's running, becomes a checklist of how to make sure that it's running. Adding QA checks, and maybe it's not even something that a command line snippet can do. Maybe it relies on a gem or a class from the code base, so we copy-paste the lines that we ran in Herb or the console last time, which we dutifully captured in Markdown, and make a rake task or a script that can run in the right context. And then we write down the command line snippet for executing it. And these are just some of the more computer-heavy improvements. It can be more human. Maybe we read a line of what we wrote and it no longer makes any sense, so we clean up the description. There's a nigh infinite number of ways to tighten up our script. What's at the core of this principle is that each use of the script also makes it better. We refine to be fine. That's that repetition I learned last night. As Thomas A. Limoncelli put it, every manual action must have the dual purpose of completing the task and improving the system. Phrased another way, the practitioner of Zen automation does not tolerate manual work that does not create an artifact or improve an existing one. 
This doesn't mean that everything has to go smoothly the greater than one times through or it was a wasted iteration. Finding an edge case, new errors, exotic failures, debugging them and carrying on is extremely valuable experience because we will have written it down for the next dev to use the script, which yes, can be us tomorrow morning. So when the third request to update locations rolled in, I was starting to catch on that this one-off task wasn't going to be a twice and done deal. I upgraded my markdown file to an executable Ruby script. Do I mean that everything was automatic, systematic, high dramatic grease lightning? No, I made a do nothing script. So that means that the script didn't do anything directly except print out each step, one at a time, waiting for our confirmation to continue each tick. Think of Ruby as our co-pilot running the in-flight checklist. Pair programming, it's Ruby's the navigator, we're the driver. A uh, little example of how you can change this up. Uh, let's take example this markdown file here, typical for what you might see in project documentation or a readme, but we live in edit mode, it's all plain text, right? Does this file have to end in .md? Let's make it .rb. The steps written out are not valid Ruby syntax, so we'll make them into strings, and they can stay essentially as they were. We can read the strings in a Ruby file just as well as text in Markdown to refer to these docs. And we'll use puts, everyone's favorite debugging tool, to print the steps out when we run it. In between though, we'll put a method call that you might not use day to day and someone who's coming to Ruby from Rails might never have encountered gets. Gets receives input from the terminal, returns it, but we're not saving it here. There's no variable, no method call, it's a pause. So we can manually do the step, hit enter on the terminal to move forward as confirmation that we're done. If we were to run this file right now, each step of the instructions would be printed to the terminal and execution would pause until we came back and pressed enter. We're less likely to lose our place, but more importantly, we've lowered the activation energy to incrementally automate this process. Just watch. We'll use one of the ways built into Ruby for executing shell commands to run that snippet for us. We don't have to copy paste it over, we've automated step two. So let's reword that puts. Past tense. By keeping the description of what's happening, someone new to the project can get vital information about how the system is put together by walking through the steps as it goes. If this is a script that's going to run all the time, maybe you get fancy and you add a command line option that skips the puts -es when possible. So several iterations down, I had made my plain text file into a do nothing script. I was the only person on the team using Vim, so I switched the macro to some Ruby. I took some descriptions of steps that were half explained or written in my own personal jargon and I made them into something that other people would understand because I was preparing for the third principle of Zen automation, share early and often. Simply put, this mindset becomes most powerful when adopted by the group and turned into team norms and culture. If one of the major benefits of automation is reducing frustration and toil, then making documentation automation available to the wider team shares the load, reducing burnout and overwork. It's a common refrain, one person from the team does a task, next time the task comes up, well, it only makes sense that the same person do it again, they already know how it goes. And then they do it again, and again. And soon that developer becomes a single point of failure. A lone sick day grinds the team to a halt, and even worse, it's just no fun, and it's not fair to that individual and increases the chance that your single point of failure took that sick day to talk to a hiring manager. Rather than sealing the learning and knowledge of a process behind an individual, do-nothing scripts that explain to a new user what's going on can be a way to share knowledge of the system while still getting things done. If the documentation and scripts live in a folder of the repo, you can leverage everything that comes along with that. Version control, code review, you might just end up with some improvements right there in PR, straight out of the gate. That folder merely by existing will encourage teammates to add to it, to pay attention to their workflows. We'll celebrate the addition of new scripts and create a positive feedback loop within the team. And if it lives near the code, it's more likely to get updated, especially if it is code that the rest of the team relies on as well. 
The more ambitious teams might even find ways to write tests that fail if a change invalidates a portion of the documentation as a reminder to keep it up, de up to date. Sharing workflows also increases consistency. We avoid costly creativity, meaning when the same problem is solved multiple ways in multiple places because divergent solutions require conditionals and complexity. But most importantly, improvement becomes multiplicative. Mina finds an edge case we wouldn't have thought of. Bell's environment is slightly different and makes the script more robust. Brittany knew about a gotcha that we didn't anticipate and catches the crash before it happens. As the team iterates together, improvement becomes almost incidental. Imagine walking away from the task and coming back three weeks later and having to do half the steps in half the time, and it's been rolled into the project's CLI tool. Brilliant. Soon CI for our teams will mean continuous improvement as we are always capturing and we refine to be fine together. New lists of locations came into the team at least once a day between when the first ask happened and launch day, but because we were sharing the workload, no one person was dragged under by repetitive cognitive stress. And my team's location upload documentation and eventually script was faster than the manual work and getting faster all the time. More edge cases were covered. More of the outliers that used to be a manual escape hatch were covered by the machine. Eventually, we landed on what is the secret killer app of automation. It's not a principle because it's not something that's gonna happen every time, but maybe it's a North Star, it's a guiding principle, something to keep in our back pockets, ready to pounce when the opportunity arises. Because the script had been approved on over time, we were able to add its functionality directly into the application. Everything was in place, it was essentially already running in production. The final step was just to add a file upload input to the super user dashboard. Instead of emailing the dev team a new spreadsheet, users would do it themselves and see the results instantaneously. By operating as we would have anyway, completing tasks, building out the application, we got a feature for free. It just fell out of the process. Surprise! <laughs> if that's not a compelling side effect of this approach, then I don't know what to do with you. <laughs> I feel like I could stop right there. <laughs> but I can't. Because the story here is not about how cool I am for having followed the path of Zen automation. The story is that I didn't do any of that. My practical example is fiction. <laughs> oh, the task was real, but my response to it is a rose-colored reimagining in 4K hindsight of how I wish I had been, and I'm still working towards being. But why didn't I act that way? I had read all the same articles and books that I have now. I always had a reason not to automate it, and I expect we're all gonna be familiar with most of these. It's urgent, AKA the stakeholder can't wait. It's faster to just do it. Automation's for DevOps. It's not worth the time it will take to automate. We've been this dog before. We've had those reasons, thought those thoughts, or had them said to us, and I listened. I didn't push back against the impatient stakeholder in my head. Doing it manually because it's faster? That might be true if you were going to charge on and write it to be automated from the start, but the approach of written notes that gradually evolve describes another way. 20 minutes to do it manually versus a day and a half to write the automation is a substantial difference. 20 minutes to do it manually versus 25 minutes to do it manually but record your terminal commands is not. So what is because it's faster, really? It's accruing debt. Resist just this once thinking by reminding ourselves of the cost of paying full price with manual work. We're leveraging our future and our team's future for exceptionally small benefit. I bought into the false choice between halting work to write an unrequested feature or getting things done. I must have done that task a dozen times before it was final. And it took roughly the same amount of time every time. It was a not insignificant portion of my day every morning. 
The frustration with that task, however, did not stay so constant. When, of course, I could have had this. With each manual execution, I buddied up to my excuses and lost all the compounding interest that this practice can provide. Now, I know that I've asked you all to think about taking a big shift in the way that you go about your work. It's a new mindset. It's built on habits that ask you to ignore present anxiety for future benefit, and that's tough. Except that you don't need to go back to work and instantly be a Zen automation master, capturing every thought, refining to the last detail, and influencing your entire company to do the same epic do-nothing scripts in every pull request. Because just as automation doesn't have to be all or nothing, neither does this practice. In my example, the real one, not the fairy tale, just a fraction of Zen automation would have saved me so much frustration. So don't look at these steps and hold yourself up against the ideal example. Not every process is automatable. But Zen and the art of incremental automation isn't about the end result. It is, again, a practice. The journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. See, there's nothing there about where we're going to end up. The destination might be right back where we started, but after a thousand miles of adventure, there and back again. So even if you never create a self-service document upload feature, like I never did, I hope you will consider yourselves practitioners of Zen automation and take those first steps of your own thousand-mile journey. Thanks.